Welcome to Season 2 of the To Health With That podcast, where we break up big health topics into small bites. I'm Amy, and this season I'll share all the tips, tricks, and hacks you need to get healthy with an MTHFR mutation in a step-by-step, week-by-week process. I can't wait. This week, let's talk about MTHFR and vaccines. This is a subject I get questions about almost daily, and the internet is filled with opinions, threatening pieces, and loud voices. But what is actually the truth? So, first, I want to give you my general thoughts about vaccines. I know that everybody has strong opinions, right? And I want to clarify my underlying views before diving into the specifics about MTHFR and vaccines. First, let me say this. I'm actually pro-vaccine. I know many of you may be offended by that, and I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, vaccines have saved millions and millions of lives that might otherwise have been lost. My uncle contracted polio as a child and had to spend months in an iron lung. He survived, but he was one of the lucky ones. I wouldn't wish that on any human. Tetanus is still largely untreatable and extremely easy to contract, but it's also easily preventable. Smallpox has been completely eradicated from North America because of vaccines. These facts are nothing to scoff at, and in my opinion, make vaccines a beneficial public health measure. Having said that, are there things that aren't done exactly right in vaccines? Well, yeah, of course there are. For decades, vaccines in multi-dose vials were preserved with thimerosal, which is essentially mercury. I'm not into injecting mercury into any human, least of all babies. There are other preservatives that I'm not a fan of mainlining as well. That includes phenol, which is a chemical used in medical research to induce tumors. Yeah, don't like it. Additionally, the list of excipient ingredients in vaccines reads like a horror show. Formaldehyde? Check. Aluminum salt? Absolutely. Polysorbate 80? Yeah, toss some in. A complete list of vaccines and their excipient ingredients in the U.S. can be found in a link on the blog post linked to the show notes. So, If you want that list, um, beware, it is a little bit scary, but it is available for you. So I'm not saying that vaccines are all hearts and flowers, but I am saying they're better than childhood polio. Still, vaccines are a very personal decision and should be made with as much information as possible about the risks and benefits of both the vaccine, your own personal family history, and the disease that that vaccine is helping to prevent. Figuring out whether MTHFR and vaccines have some kind of a special link is actually more difficult than you might anticipate because there's not a lot of research. There is something called the Adverse Events Reporting Database, which is wonderful. And so we'll we'll use that as a tool. Within the MTHFR community and the internet at large, we all kind of suspect that MTHFR folks might have more trouble than average with vaccines. The idea is logically derived from the fact that we MTHFR folks have a harder than average time eliminating heavy metals, which matters in light of the aluminum and mercury thing. And also people with MTHFR have a higher tendency towards blood clots when our methylation is unbalanced and homocysteine is high. So well-managed MTHFR doesn't increase clotting risk. But poorly managed MTHFR with a high homocysteine does. Research on this is extremely limited in terms of actual vaccine reactions. It just hasn't been done. So the objective data largely is not here yet. Even a search of the U.S. Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System yields very little fruit. This is in part because most of the people who have MTHFR are entirely unaware of it. And so, you know, they wouldn't report that. But also in the grand scheme of things, knowledge about MTHFR is pretty new. So in the VAERS, it's called Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, five adverse events total uh, are reported in clients with known MTHFR. In one, the Tdap vaccine produced extreme fatigue that limited their ability to work. One reaction was in a child born to a mother who got the DTAP in the eighth month of her pregnancy and the child had extreme eczema. The others were to COVID-19 vaccines in its various forms and included severe flu-like symptoms, exacerbation of chronic fatigue, and short-term allergic reaction. 
The adverse events are self-reported, and what information the patients share about their clinical history is pretty self-directed, so it's hard to draw conclusions from this information or lack of it. There are a couple of research studies, however, that do give us a little bit of insight. The most important one, I think, is about MTHFR and the smallpox vaccine. The Journal of Infectious Disease actually conducted a study looking at adverse events to the smallpox vaccine and various genetic polymorphisms. In this study, MTHFR polymorphisms were associated with adverse event risk in two separate trials, and that's significant. That matters, right? This is the best and most relevant evidence that people with MTHFR polymorphisms might have to be cautious. But of course, this only tests one vaccine and not the rest of them. It's a start, but it's unwise to generalize to all vaccines because of one study on one vaccine. There's also uh, another useful study is a case report published in the Journal of Neurology about two young women with MTHFR polymorphisms who developed blood clots after the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Both of these women did have an MTHFR polymorphism, but they also had a perfect storm of clotting risk factors that can't be overlooked. In the case of these two women, MTHFR can contribute to clotting, certainly. But also, both were taking estrogen-based birth control pills, which increase clotting risk. Both had a prior history of deep vein thrombosis, which, that's clotting. And the vaccine itself is for a virus that is known to increase clotting risk. These two patients certainly had adverse events related to the vaccine, and MTHFR was one contributing factor, but the other factors can't be overlooked. There's also a lot of questions out there about MTHFR, vaccines, and autism risk. And this is dicey territory. There's a known increase in the risk of autism for people with MTHFR variants, and also in mothers who had high levels of folic acid supplementation during their pregnancy. You can read all about that in a post that is linked to this article. There's also an increased risk with heavy metal exposure, and even possibly, albeit controversially, the MMR vaccine. The data doesn't exist here, right? This is all supposition. So we don't know if kiddos who get a full complement of vaccines and who have MTHFR have any different risk than kids who have MTHFR who don't get the vaccines, right? That data is does not exist. We don't know. In my mind, it comes down to a logical pro and con question. If your kiddos have many risk factors for autism, then it might make sense to be more cautious about adding other risk factors to the stack. That can include vaccines and their incipients. This also includes avoiding environmental sources of heavy metals as well. This isn't just about vaccines. This is about toxin avoidance, getting good nutrition, and doing what you can, including carefully considering your vaccine options. This is the last podcast episode for this season, and I thank you so much for being here and offering me 10 minutes of your week. I really value that. As usual, summer is going to be devoted to family and outdoors, but once school starts, we'll be back for season three. Look for a season three trailer in the next few weeks. It is about a new and exciting topic. I'm collaborating with a dear friend and colleague, and I cannot wait to get started. Over the summer, there will still be new blog posts, including topics like keeping MTHFR kiddos healthy, the best antidepressants for MTHFR, and signs of MTHFR in babies. Genetic Rockstars is in full swing no matter what, and you can join us there at community.tohealthwiththat.com. Also, over the summer, enrollment will be open for a beta test version of a course called MTHFR for Life, which will start in the autumn. You can check that out at courses.tohealthwiththat.com. Just a hint, the beta test version will get a hugely discounted price, 75% off, and also a lot more personal attention from me, so it might be worth a look. Have a great summer. I can't wait to see you in September.